right, let's go ahead and get started. I just wanted to say a few words again about um, the quizzes. If you find that you haven't done particularly well on the last two, do not suffer in silence. Okay, I really want you to make an appointment and come talk to me and, and we'll figure out a game plan about how you might be able to study more efficiently or better or the right things or see if you're getting the right stuff from the notes. Um, because these are the two that you can drop. So from this point on, you need to be brilliant. Okay, so whatever it takes to do that, aside from cheating, of course, um, <laughs> I will be happy to help you with. So make sure you come and talk to me if, there's, if, if you haven't been doing well. Um, today I want to finish up the lecture on uh, speech breathing. Any questions about that so far from last time? Okay, so I want to finish that up and then I want to talk about the respiratory observation and then we'll talk about um, breathing across the lifespan. Okay, so we, we talked about um, where we ended last time was talking about this new improved view of how people use uh, expiratory muscles when they're breathing. And we ended with uh, briefly going over the fact that the diaphragm needs something to contract against, to be able to contract efficiently. So that means that we're abandoning the view that, for speech breathing only, we're abandoning the view that the um, muscles of expiration are only active in when you're below resting expiratory level. We also use the muscles of expiration to provide support for the muscles of inspiration when we're breathing in for speech. Okay, so it sounds a little incongruous that you'd have expiratory muscles active when you're breathing in for speech, but they're providing support for the diaphragm to contract against. Okay? That gives the diaphragm more mechanical efficiency. It lets it contract quicker and with greater force. So we want that kind of big, quick inspiration uh, for speech breathing. So we have the concept here of the chest wall, which is really the combination, thinking in front, the combination of the rib cage and the abdomen. And the chest wall should be moving in parallel. So the rib cage should be moving in parallel with the abdomen. So that when we're expanding to breathe in, the abdominals should move out a little bit, still providing support for the diaphragm to contract against, and the rib cage should be expanding. They should be doing this together. So we th think about the chest wall, the rib cage and abdomen is moving as a unit. Most of the time people do this. The time it gets a little bit squirrely is, um, for example, when I studied cheerleaders who were very, very afraid of ever having their tummy pooch out when they breathed in, they would breathe in and would have their abs sucked in so that they would still look adorable when they were still breathing to cheer. That's actually paradoxical breathing. If you're not allowing things to expand and you have uh, part of the chest wall moving in the opposite direction of where it should be moving. It's called paradoxical breathing. You don't need me to spell it, do you? Okay, just checking. My husband can't spell it all, so I'm always spelling things for him. So paradoxical breathing means that uh, the structures, either the rib cage or the abdomen, is moving in an opposite direction of where it should be. So that means when you're breathing in, what you should have is both the rib cage and the abdomen moving out somewhat. If one of them's moving inward instead, it's paradoxical. It's a problem because it's less efficient. You're not allowing the, the whole system to expand to allow as much air in as possible. Questions on the mechanical parallel idea? Okay. So the muscles that we're using to support the diaphragmatic contraction when we're breathing in, uh, the, muscle, the muscle is the rectus abdominis. This is the six-pack ab muscle. It's the only way I ever remember it. So the whole purpose of the six-pack abs is to provide, well, not aside from looking like a hunk, it's to provide support for the diaphragm to contract against. So this is the muscle that's going to facilitate quick, efficient diaphragmatic contraction and quick and efficient inspiration.
So the view that we have transitioned to from the days of Draper, Latifogan, and Witterich to Hickson and Weismer more recently is we know that the abdominal muscles are active in inspiration, providing a platform for the diaphragm to contract against. And the, uh, the other points that they found when they reanalyzed the data from data, uh, Draper, Latifogan, and Witterich were that the, um, the rectus abdominis can be contracted much earlier than just at resting expiratory level. The one that I really want you to remember is the expiratory muscles are contracted during inspiration to provide support. That's the one that matters the most for right now. Now the abs are also responsible for helping with linguistic stress. So when you need to emphasize a word, it's a little abdominal pulse that gives you that extra emphasis, that little bit extra of subglottal pressure that we use for speech emphasis. So remember that subglottal pressure is directly related to intensity. So if I'm trying to emphasize a point or a word, I, and you can feel it when you do this, you don't necessarily have to do it right now, but sometime when you're talking, you emphasize something, you feel a little pulse of your abdomen, and that's giving that extra subglottal pressure to make that word stressed and a little bit louder. So we don't always, you know, people think to varying degrees about how much the abs are actually involved in um, speech production. I wanted to show you a brief video uh, where you can see their involvement pretty well. And um, this video is when my son did gymnastics and had cute little two-pack abs. Now I'm sure he has them there somewhere, but he's a musician now and you can't see them at all. And what I want you to look at is his abdominal movement, which in this video is really pretty remarkable. Just look at his belly. Got a random game, so I dance my finger. Do what you could do. Do what you could do. Got to read the books, got to find all the hooks, got to win all the games, got to dance my finger. Got to do what See how do. it gets contracted? It gets got to the end of the utterance, squeezing the last of the air out. Got to find all the beasts, got to win all the races, got to read all the books, got to find all the hooks, got to win all the games, got to dance my finger. Got to do what you could do. Lots of other contortions too, but the main thing is the abs. Little catch breath in there with the abs. Do what you gotta do. Do what you gotta do. Even if it's not right, I for you. Yes, he was a budding singer at that time. Um, yeah, that was several years ago. He would shoot me if he knew I showed you that. <laughs> Well, he did at the time. He, he recorded it, knowing that I would use it for speech science. He's kind of immune to that by now, because he's really good at doing voices and stuff, so now and then I have him do that, too. Um, but he would want me to tell you that he looks nothing like that now. He's way cooler. Um, but I did think it showed a really, really good abdominal movement for stress and how you can use the abs to squeeze that last little bit of air out when you want to keep on talking. Um, he did a little bit of paradoxing where you know, things were kind of moving out of sync with each other. Um, but a lot of kids do that. So let's summarize now just the respiratory needs for speech production. Um, when you become a speech pathologist, you need to keep in mind that very rarely is a person's problem based on uh, reduced respiratory capacity. Okay, almost always we have enough air to talk on. We may have to compensate a little bit. We may have to breathe in bigger than we would really like to to have enough air. Um, but it's very, very rare for everyday people that you're going to work on respiration. The people who do work on respiration, who care tons about it, are professional singers and performers. There it really matters how you breathe in, that you do it effortlessly, that you have enough to support a projected voice. But for most clients that we see, it's not really going to be an issue. So anytime we see someone who kind of has this breathy voice and is using short phrases, most of the time the problem is going to be with laryngeal valving rather than with inadequate respiratory uh, capacity. So one of the things that I also want you to think about with normal speech breathing is that it's incredibly flexible. 
We hardly ever look like that perfect graph where you have breathing in, breathing out, breathe in, twice tidal inspiration, go down to REL, breathe in again. People just don't do that. You know what conversational interactions are like. It doesn't matter if you're at the end of a tidal expiration. If you have to get a word in, you're going to start talking, even though you didn't breathe in beforehand. And we, we get to do that. It works fine. We've got enough air to talk in. We tighten up a little bit more in the laryngeal system. And we can compensate for that, for the fact that we didn't breathe into twice tidal inspiration to, um, to jump into the conversation. If somebody wants to keep the floor and they're monologuing away and don't want anybody else to interrupt, they'll keep talking way below resting expiratory level. Doesn't matter to them that it's inefficient. So we're designed for flexibility. There's always going to be an interaction between respiratory forces and laryngeal effort. And our system can accommodate it. And we always try to keep the same acoustic output regardless of where we are in the respiratory system. We'll find a way to make it sound right. For people who have vocal pathologies, that may not be the best approach. And there you might have to work on how they're using their respiratory system. But for most of us, we can get away with it. One of the things that early inexperienced speech pathologists tend to um, kind of zone in on is this concept of clavicular breathing. And everybody's worried about clavicular breathing because um, it's supposedly inefficient. Um, this is when you, you bring up your shoulders when you breathe in. And um, so why is this a problem? What's, what's the potential problem with clavicular breathing? <clears throat> Try doing it and see what's weird about it. Anybody pick up why it's not a good thing? Mm -hmm. You're not taking in enough air? Potentially not taking in enough air. So if people who cl clavicularly breathe, that sounds so wrong. People who do that may not be allowing the diaphragm to go down. And so they're expanding the upper part of the lungs by kind of pulling it along with the shoulder elevation instead of also allowing the lungs to expand in the inferior direction. So it may not give you quite as full a breath. I was thinking it would affect, you couldn't do it while you were speaking because you, the checking action would be more difficult to keep going on one breath if you're pulled up and it's pulling down. Pulled up and it's pulling down. Are you saying because by pulling up you made the expiratory relaxation forces greater? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, that potentially could be a problem. And also if you do that, you may be one of those people who just stays tensed up here. One of the things that people worry about is muscle tension is rarely isolated to single muscles. And because the shoulders are so close to the neck and the neck is so close to the laryngeal area, people worry that if you raise your mus the shoulders, you can be spreading tension in this direction. How many of you actually know lots of people who do clavicular breathing? Do you see it a lot? I can tell you where to look for it. Kids who sing. Especially kids who sing in choirs. Yeah, they go, I'm ready now. Okay. <laughs> they're, they're just, they're just, you can look at a whole choir and see all the kids raise their shoulders. Um, but it's usually only, well, it, it's found most often, at least in my experience, in untrained kids who sing. Uh, most people don't do it very much. Seems like that's why every time I can remember being in choir, you go over, you know, okay, well, don't breathe with your shoulders, breathe, you know, from here, not up here. So it's reinforced a lot. And that's the only reason I even know about clavicular breathing. Or I didn't know reinforced it was called that. Reinforced to not uh, breathe, though. They said don't breathe with your shoulders. Right, exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think choir directors try to train you to do it. But I think when you're younger and you have a smaller lung capacity to work with and you're expected to sing big, long phrases kind of loud, you're going to try to get air in any way you can. So it may feel like it helps you get a bigger breath. It's certainly a more effortful way to breathe. I know that I've seen choir directors right before they start the kids go, yeah, and so maybe they're instructing them <laughs> yeah. without knowing it. It's like kids theater people who start off with the audience yelling. There is a great way to protect your voice. Yeah, yeah, so sometimes they don't do the right thing. My choir directors always told us to expand outward. I mean, he was a very, very good choir director, but um, if kids learn at the beginning to keep their shoulders level and expand out this way, uh, then I think you can eliminate that as a problem. Okay, so just the basics about speech breathing compared with 
uh, breathing at rest. We know there's a longer expiratory duration. We know that we breathe into bigger lung volumes. And we do our best when we're at our maximal efficiency. We do our best to stay in an operating range that's right around at resting expiratory level. So we don't need a lot of muscle forces to counteract the relaxation forces. We want breathing to be easy. Twice tidal inspiration seems to be a pretty good level to breathe into. Questions about speech breathing in general? A lot of what we've talked about for speech breathing holds true for singing, typically just in a little bit more extreme form. Okay, let's talk about the uh, respiratory assignment. Could you go ahead and flip to the screen? So the respiratory assignment um, is an observation that I'd like you to do where you're comparing. You have a couple of different options to compare. Um, what you're looking for is a situation that elicits differences in breathing patterns that you can talk about and describe, okay? So some examples are a person talking neutrally and that person talking very emotionally. Um, these show up a lot on soap operas, okay? So you can, you can observe anything. It can be on TV. It work, the observation works best if the person's wearing something tight rather than a loose sweatshirt. If it's someone you know well, it works even better when their shirt's off. So you want to be able to see the chest wall moving. Most of the time on the soaps, I think they wear pretty tight stuff. So that's a good observation <laughs> if you're looking for um, the emotional thing. Um, another option is a person talking softly versus a person talking loudly. Some of these you can elicit. If you have a kid, you can tell them, I want you to read this story really, really, really quietly, and then I want you to read it as loud as you can. See what they do differently. So you're allowed to set this up. You're not going to tell them, OK, I'm going to look at how you're breathing now, because you want to try to make it as natural as possible. Um, but if you can't find something natural to observe, go ahead and elicit something. Um, a person speaking versus a person singing. If you know any singers, this is a really good one because most singers do very, very different things when they're, singing, when they're breathing for singing versus when they're breathing for speech. Um, another good one is a little kid talking uh, versus an elderly person talking. They also do very, very different things uh, controlling their respiration. So if you know somebody and you want to set something up, that works fine. If you want to watch it in TV or a movie, that works fine too. As long as you find different situations that are eliciting different breathing patterns. I don't really care how you do it. Okay, so what you're going to give me in the report is some introduction that explains the, um, the comparison that you're making. You're going to report on the situation that you set up or the situation that you're observing. You're going to report on the differences in their breathing strategies uh, between the two situations. And the kinds of things you look for are how big a breath did they take? Um, did they use the same rib, uh, abdominal, I'm sorry, chest wall pattern to breathe in for the different situations? Um, really just try to elicit something that gives you something to talk about. Did they run out of air in one situation? How well did they manage the air? Did one seem more efficient than the other? And then you're going to try to interpret it. Why do you think these differences existed? So if it's a little kid, maybe they were working really hard because we know their respiratory system is smaller. Um, if it's an elderly person who maybe had a breathy voice, they had to breathe differently because they were losing lots of air. If it's someone emotional in the soap opera who's yelling at somebody, they needed more air to be loud. Those are the kinds of just common sense interpretations that you're doing. Doesn't have to be lengthy. You know, a page is probably fine. So don't, don't feel like you have to go on and on forever on this. And um, if we make it due on February 17th, then you have two weekends to work with. 
um, like a page double spaced or page single spaced? Everything for me is double spaced because I'm terribly blind. <laughs> so no funky fonts, um, 12 point Times New Roman, double spaced. Questions? So start thinking of ideas. If you want to bounce some ideas next time we meet, if you want to email me about ideas, that's fine. Um, you know, this, this shouldn't be something that you have to go way out of your way to find people to observe. Okay? All right. So let's pick up now and go on to uh, breathing throughout the lifespan. Yeah, this isn't Andrew's day. He'd kill me for these two because there's baby pictures. Yeah, that's what I do when I see them. Oh! <laughs> In the third. They're all him. <laughs> oh, you're so easy. <laughs> yeah, I know. He was a little chubby. Um, okay, so the reason we're talking about breathing through the lifespan is the respiratory system changes fairly dramatically. Uh, first from birth to three, and then as we age. Um, and when you're working with people with speech disorders, it's important to know what kind of respiratory system they're working with. What might they be need, need to be compensating for uh, in the system? So we want to talk about some of the changes uh, that occur as a newborn develops and then as people age. The newborn respiratory system um, is just an amazing uh, thing to contemplate. There's a researcher uh, in ca Canada, Carol Boliak, who did her doctoral work looking at how newborns breathed. And she did the work using um, uh, little, little teeny tiny respiratraces, little bands going around the kid's rib cage and abdomen. And um, she came up with some really, really interesting data and she, she, she elucidated a number of points that helps us understand things like sudden infant death syndrome. Because the kids have a respiratory system when they're newborns that is incredibly working against them. So the rib cage of a newborn isn't bony. The rib cage of a newborn is ridiculously flexible. It's not completely ossified when the baby is born. And when you couple that highly flexible and compliant rib cage with elastic recoil of the lungs that's just as strong as an adult's, you start having the kid need to work hard to breathe. So the newborn has elasticity in the lungs that really, really make the one lungs want to collapse, just like we do as adults, but we have a bony rib cage to work against it and the, the lungs are linked to that bony rib cage with the pleural linkage. The pleural linkage still exists in the newborn. So the child has extremely elastic lungs wanting to collapse and a very, very flexible, compliant rib cage. So when we think about resting expiratory level in adults being at about 38% of vital capacity, because of this tendency in the newborn respiratory system to go towards expiration, the kids can go down to like 10% of their vital capacity, which is incredibly low in that vital capacity curve. When they're down there, they really don't get very good gas exchange. So the baby is working much, much harder to stay above what we would consider our natural point of resting expiratory level. The system naturally wants to go as low as 10% of the baby's vital capacity. For them not to do that, they're constantly exerting extra inspiratory muscle effort. Questions so far? So you've got the really compliant rib cage, strong elasticity in the lungs, forcing the system, without the baby exerting lots of effort, forcing the system well below resting expiratory level. So healthy babies can usually handle this. 
any baby who's born with some kind of compromise like weakness is really, really going to be at risk. If they don't have the ability to work against this expiratory recoil action, um, they can have problems. So I'm sure you all remember um, the campaign that started Back to Sleep, that you should put babies to sleep on their backs instead of on their tummies. Because for ages and ages, mothers put the kid on their tummies so that if they uh, barfed, they wouldn't in inhale what they threw up. And one of the people believe now that lying on their stomach is one of the things that contributes to the likelihood of sudden infant death syndrome. So if you picture that, you have a baby on its stomach, you have elastic recoil forces that are in an expiratory direction, the baby has to lift its whole body up to try to breathe in, and it's just too much work. So any compromised baby who's weak um, just isn't going to be able to do that. So I think most people now, you know, it's the, it was a really good campaign. I think most people are aware that babies should be sleeping on their back or on their side with one of those wedge pillow things. Um, but they, I'm, I'm really been always interested in SIDS. Um, and, other, and so I always look for articles that find ways to uh, prevent this. And the most recent study that I've come across said uh, sleeping with a fan on can just dramatically reduce the likelihood of a kid's uh, sudden infant death, like by 72%, which is huge. So, you know, now I'm paranoid and think I want this campaign, okay, back to sleep with a fan. I don't know how to make it catchy, but I think somebody needs that one. The other thing that I just found the other day was um, Vicks Vapor Rub isn't good for kids, which I thought was really strange because you think, oh, vapor opens up everything. And um, the researchers who did this study found that the kids' airways are already really, really narrow. And Vix ends up generating more mucus in the airways. So it actually makes the problem worse. And the kids end up with more congested airways than that nice, big inhaling, vaporous, you know, breathe in that we think we get. So those are just little points. Um, but I want you to understand the concept of the disadvantage that physiology puts on a newborn's respiratory system. Um, they really have to work hard just to stay alive. I'm always amazed when kids start growing, you know, because it seems like they have so much against them uh, when they're little. So in the fetal lung, when the baby's actually in utero, um, the lungs aren't used at all. So this is one of the things that uh, when the baby is born prematurely, we know that the respiratory system is one of the biggest problems with premature babies because the alveoli really aren't developed yet. Um, in a premature infant because they haven't used them. They've been exchanging oxygen and CO2 um, in the placenta. So one of the biggest um, challenges with uh, premature babies, and now they're surviving earlier and earlier. I mean, teeny tiny little babies are surviving. Um, the respiratory system is what takes so long to develop. Okay, so let's talk about things that change in the first three years. I'm sorry, Lynn, go ahead. Um, is, that, is that because the lungs are one of the last things to develop, or is it because, like you said, the rib cage is so elastic? And it, is the rib cage slow to develop, or are the lungs The slow? rib cage is slow to ossify, and the alveoli within the lungs are slow to develop. Okay. So it's sort of two things going against the baby at once. Mm -hmm. But I think the rib cage is less of an in issue in a premature baby than the really immature lungs because the baby now needs the lungs themselves to be exchanging air without the placenta being in place. I was, I was also just wondering, uh, do the lungs just develop with the pleural linings attached or do they start and then grow up or like how, how does that work? I couldn't tell you. So much magic happens in development. <laughs> Yeah, I, I really couldn't tell you. Um, you know, so many cells are migrating. That's why people are so interested in stem cells because they can turn into just about anything. So they, they move, to, they migrate somewhere, they turn into what they need. Um, and I guess I picture 
I picture the pleural linkage being in place as the lungs are developing. Because otherwise, what, they suddenly reach out and attach? You know, I, I kind of think it has to be in place and it's developing with the pleural linkage in place. I, I can't imagine it doing it otherwise. So that part should be ready. It's just inside the lungs, the alveoli aren't developed yet. Yeah. So under that little, are there, are there in your belly the, the lungs are filled with liquid or they're filled with air? Or like when, whenever they come for their first breath, it's they have to cough out like something? Or? They don't cough out anything. And again, there, there are lots of things about that, of, of gestation that I don't understand, but I, I never picture the lungs filled with liquid because the, there's no need to open the vocal folds. There's no need to open the airway. So even though they're surrounded by amniotic fluid, they shouldn't be breathing that in and out. Um, when I was pregnant, my son had almost constant hiccups. Oh, yeah. And my doctor told me it's because he was going to be a screamer when he was born. <laughs> and he was. But um, is, it, is it them exercising their muscles and stuff? <laughs> the hiccups in utero? <laughs> Those of you who have never experienced this are really missing out. <laughs> when, when, when a little baby inside you has hiccups, it's like zipping across. <laughs> it's like zing, zing, zing. It is the strangest feeling on the planet. Um, and what was the question? <laughs> Sorry, I was reminiscing. Well, um, whenever I uh, talked to my doctor about it, because it's such a weird feeling yeah. and it was just constant, he said it's because the baby was going to be a screamer. Well, that's just weird. Okay, so we can rule that one out. What was the second part? Um, was basically, is that them preparing to breathe? Is that... Oh, I, mean, I just what? don't think so. Um, the hiccups, we didn't really talk about hiccups, which is actually one of my favorite topics. Um, Hiccups are diaphragmatic spasms. And um, in a developing system, I don't think it takes much for muscle tone to go from okay to spasming. I really don't, because the system is constantly changing. In most people, when, when grown-ups develop hiccups, it's, caused, it's believed to be caused by some irritation to the phrenic nerve um, that causes the diaphragm to spasm. Um, so, no, I don't, I don't think it's practice for being loud or anything like that. <laughs> yeah, they, they are strange, though. We, we will try not to sidetrack on all of the cures for hiccups, which is my next favorite topic. <laughs> um, okay, so let's talk about changes in the first three years, where the kid becomes much, much safer as a breather, uh, which is really fortunate. So you don't have to worry about them nearly as much by the time they're three compared to when they were newborns. So everything happens in the right direction. Um, we know that in premature babies, the lungs don't have many alveoli. Uh, they develop very, very quickly. They get bigger. They get lots, lots more of them. So all of those little grapey structures just really explode in terms of quantity uh, as well as size. The other good thing that happens is that the airways, which are very, very small in a newborn, um, the airways get larger in radius, so they just get bigger around. And we know that's going to decrease resistance, it's going to mean when uh, the baby's congested it's not going to be nearly as much of a problem as when they have teeny tiny airways. And the lungs increase in size as well, so all, the, every part of the baby is growing. Um, and the things that I think are the most important in terms of development, uh, is really the, the bronchial tree getting bigger in radius because that's going to make breathing much, much more efficient and get the air to the alveoli uh, with less resistance and greater ease. So things change mechanically as well. Um, so we've got the, the rib cage gradually ossifying, so it loses that flexibility. Um, the rib cage in a baby tends to be pretty vertical and we know that in adult, it has that little bit of flare that gives us some extra torque. So that gradually changes shape uh, more towards the, um, the flared out version. And we already mentioned that airway resistance uh, is decreasing. So lower resistance is always good. So functionally, we expect all of the volumes all of those subdivisions that we talked about, we expect them to be getting bigger. 
um, because the child is able to exchange the gases uh, more easily, their breathing rate slows down. So when you look at little babies, sometimes it almost seems like they're panting, they're breathing so fast. That gradually, as, as the lungs get bigger and um, the airways get larger, their breathing rate um, begins to look less pant-like. So their ability to uh, get oxygen out of the bloodstream uh, is better. Um, everything just improves in terms of pulmonary circulation. So you can picture the whole uh, respiratory system really becoming more adult-like, certainly taking the child out of that at-risk phase um, that they're in when they're a newborn. We know that lots is happening with myelinization of the nervous system. Um, you probably recall from neuroanatomy how important myelin is for quick conduction of neural impulses. This is going to help efficiency as well. Um, it's going to help uh, quick reactions on the baby's part if they aspirate something. With good myelinization, they'll be able to cough it out quicker. So again, the whole nervous system's just becoming more sophisticated and all of this means that the respiratory system's working better and the kid is less at risk uh, for having breathing problems. So those are the things, so the most drastic changes from a baby at risk to not having to worry about the kid happens from birth to three. Do you have a question? Oh, sorry. Um, my son was born with wet lungs, meaning he swallowed amniotic fluid and he had subsequent seizures because of that. And they said, of course, it would go away, it may go away over time, and it did. We took him off the phenobarbital, but so when does myelination complete? Oh, myelinization is a relatively slow process. The most dramatic changes happen at around two years of age. But in terms of completeness, um, it goes on for a long time. I can't put a, a, a year on it for you. I, I don't really know that. Um, I know the most dramatic changes are from zero to two. So with the wet lungs, what, what did they do when, the ba when your baby was born? Um, well, he was, I had him with a midwife, so thank God we weren't, I wasn't on any other type of a medication. Um, he was in the NICU for two weeks. Um, he was on a respirator for a couple of days, and then they put him on room air. And how, how were the wet lungs diagnosed? How did you know that amniotic fluid got in the baby's lungs? Uh, I don't know if it was a scan that they did or, or what. He did, when he came out, he didn't cry. We, like, we waited for him. He didn't, he was very shallow. He was sucking his, um, his abdomen in, trying uh -huh. to get some air. He, like, he just did not, we just waited, and he did not cry. He was just trying to get every ounce of breath that he possibly could. Mm -hmm. So um, um, that's when he, they took him to the NICU. And then tell me again what they did to treat it? Uh, phenobarbital for the seizures. For the seizures because, and for the breathing? Right, for the breathing. Um, they had him on a respirator um, just to kind of, because it, the phenobarbital and the respirator. You mean like a ventilator, so they put it right. tube down and something was actually breathing for him. Right. Oh, that's major. For a short while. And yeah. then they took him off that like the second or third day and put him on just room air, just the tube in his nose. Yeah. Because yeah. the phenobarbital kept him from having the seizures, which is why he was would stop breathing. Yeah, I never, I, I don't know much about that phenomenon of amniotic <laughs> fluid actually getting into the lungs. Did, did you get the connection for why that would cause a seizure? Um, because he was in the birth canal for too long. So between so it was a him, lack of oxygen? Right, that, between that him emerging and like being, he was just kind of stuck there and swallowed oh, it while he was in the canal. And he's okay now? I'm sorry, he's perfectly fine. Oh, that's good. Too much fine. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's a good thing though, compared to his rocky start. Huh. That's good. Yeah, um, I guess breathing is just something you really just have to worry about all the time. And it's the sort of insidious things that, you know, that kind of get you that you don't realize. I don't think you could ever be educated enough to keep a kid okay from birth to three. It's just luck. <laughs> Pray they've got really good guardian angels, you know. <laughs> okay, so they've survived till three. They get to be toddlers at this point. Two or three, I guess, is toddling. Um, you can tell this is an old picture before cell phones, right? We had this old-fashioned phone that my kid had to use. <laughs> um, babies do some really cool things, though, with breathing that, that people kind of overinterpret. Um, 
people know, particularly Carol Boliak, the Canadian researcher who's done all the studies on newbies. Uh, and we may think this is obvious, but she was one of the first to document that babies really, really do breathe in and then scream. So they're phonating on expiration, which means they're not doing all kinds of weird stuff that they could be doing. They're not doing, you know, phonating on inspiration. They breathe in. So basically from birth, you have respiration coordinated with the laryngeal system. So everything already is starting to work together as a functional unit which really is pretty cool. So a newbie you know, knows that, okay, I breathed in, now I bring my vocal folds together, and now I scream, um, as opposed to trying to do it in any um, paradoxical or inefficient way. So we know that toddlers um, do some things that are very efficient. They initiate their voicing right around the middle of their vital capacity, so they're not working hard to talk. They're not working hard to phonate. They do lots of different things, though, with their chest wall. They don't believe at that point in the mechanical parallel concept. They'll try just about anything. So really, they're exploring behaviors. And most of those behaviors produce the same acoustic output. Um, and at some point, they might develop some efficiency. One of the things that we find a lot in um, breathing studies are gender differences. With babies, we don't have that. The gender differences really show up at puberty when boys start to grow really, really differently from girls and get bigger. Um, so for infants and toddlers, uh, we don't see gender differences. So people have studied um, speech breathing characteristics in uh, somewhat older children. And one study that's worth looking at is a comparison of how seven-year-old kids breathe compared to somewhat older kids. And what the um, researchers found was that the seven-year-old kids, and, and the older kids were kind of in a group by themselves. The seven-year-old kids were really different from the other ones. They found that the youngest of these four groups uh, tended to initiate and terminate breath groups higher in the lung volume curve. So the way to understand this is you have to picture that vital capacity curve and they are breathing in to a higher point in the vital capacity curve and they're not breathing out very low. Okay, so they kind of shifted their breathing for speech upward in the curve. Does that mean the resting expiratory level shifts? No, if their resting expiratory level stayed the same. This is, this is their... Um, Resting expiratory level is going to stay constant, regardless of where you breathe for speech. It's still always the reference level. So it means that compared to resting expiratory level, they're breathing in higher and ending their breath groups higher. And they breathe in more than the other kids did. So they're taking bigger breaths. So any of you who have been around seven-year-olds know that most of them are not quiet. They tend to have that sort of loud kid's voice. Um, and the, the airway, even though the airway became a lot less resistant as the, the infant grew to be the age of seven, it's still a higher resistance than older kids have. So the seven-year-olds are working with a smaller vocal tract. The trachea is smaller. The bronchial tubes are smaller. The, um, the, the whole area that you're producing voice through is smaller. So they've got higher resistance. And taking bigger breaths higher in the vital capacity curve means that you're able to, count, you're able to work against the resistance more easily. It gives you more natural effort. You're using the passive relaxation forces to help you get the sound out. Is that making sense? Okay, so if you shift your breathing upward, you take in bigger breaths, and then you start talking, you're higher in the VC curve, so there's more expiratory relaxation forces, and then it's going to help you talk louder and um, overcome the resistance of the vocal tract. So the older kids look pretty much like grown-ups. They did a few things that were different. Um, they used more air. Per, per syllable. 
So they might have sounded a little bit breathy. Um, they didn't valve quite as, fish, as efficiently as the adults did. Um, but really, the distinction that I want you to keep in mind is the respiratory system and vocal tract of the seven-year-olds is still fairly small, offering high resistance compared to the older kids in this study. Okay? So they concluded that body size uh, made a difference. Body size is what made the biggest impact on the speech breathing strategies that the kids used. Okay, the other study that I wanted to highlight was a comparison of speech breathing between kids versus adults. And I wanted to talk just a little bit about variables. When you take a research class, you'll get into this some more. And if you remember back from junior high science, you've talked about this too. Um, in terms of variables that you can manipulate, variables that you're measuring, and variables that the subjects kind of come to the study with. So the variables that were addressed in this study, um, the first one was age, adult versus child. So what kind of variable is that? Somebody push your magic little button. No? <laughs> okay. Do you guys remember attribute independent variable? Attribute being an attribute of the subject, something that you may be interested in comparing, but you can't manipulate it. Okay, so age is always an attribute independent variable. So in this study, they had one attribute independent variable of age. Um, they had two other variables that they were manipulating, things that you asked the participants in the study to do differently. And one of them was loudness. So they had two loudness conditions. One was as loud as the kid and adult usually talked, and the other was being louder than that. And they had two types of consonants. One. Um, one was a consonant that used lots and lots of air, and others were consonants that didn't use much air. So what are some high volume consonants that use lots of air to produce? What's a consonant that, that just takes lots of air to be? S. S. Fricatives typically take a lot of air to produce. Okay, so they would have a passage loaded with fricatives. That would be a high volume passage where the, the person has to expend a lot of air just saying the sounds that are in the passage. Okay? So the two um, active independent variables, the ones that the researcher manipulated, are loudness and type of consonant. So here are the results of the study, and I want you to get kind of used to uh, reading graphs because at first glance they can be just too ugly for words. The first thing that you do when you're reading a figure like this is look at what the, how the axes are labeled and what the axes represent. And I always forget ordinate and abscissa, so I always use horizontal and vertical because those I can remember. So in the vertical axis here, we have the percent of vital capacity. So we've talked about that a lot. Most of the measures that we take in speech breathing are somehow referenced to a percent of the vital capacity that the person has. So 0% vital capacity is down here, 100% is here. And these measures are uh, referring to how much air the subjects breathed in in the different conditions. So down here we have the different speaking conditions. High means the um, high volume consonants, full lots of lots of fricatives. Here is low volume consonants, so no fricatives. And then we've got two other conditions. So it gets kind of messy when you've got three independent variables. Studies are much neater when you just do two, but this had age, consonant type, and loudness condition. So somehow you have to represent all those on a graph. So the open bars here are the adults. The dark bars are the kids. And C refers to conversational loudness, and L refers to the loud condition. Okay, so you kind of have to get oriented um, before you try to interpret it. So what you see is, um, let's look at what the kids did in the loud condition 
for low volume consonants. So low volume consonants are over here. The kids are in the dark in so many ways. And we've got, you're looking at the comparison of the lung volumes between comfortable loudness and the loud condition. So what do you notice here between comfortable loudness and the loud condition? What did the kids do? Same thing. They didn't change anything. Okay. So when the consonants didn't require lots and lots of air, they didn't change anything to get louder. Okay. They didn't, they didn't need to. But you do have to consider, they didn't change lung volume, but they still were getting louder. The, the experimenter wouldn't let them just fake it and do the same loudness level they did in the conversational condition. So what are they doing to get louder? They're not doing it by increased subglottal pressure. They're not doing it by, yeah, <laughs> the, going like this. <laughs> Go ahead. Are they, are they using forced exhalation? to talk? Like, are they moving more air than the adults? Uh, Is that why they're... No, I think the way to think of it, we really haven't gotten to this yet, so it's not quite fair. You always want to think of a trade-off between the respiratory system and the laryngeal system. So in order to maintain the same loudness, or I'm sorry, in order to get louder, if you're not going to put more air behind it, you have to tighten up here. There's always a trade-off. So it's not necessarily a healthy thing to do. So I'm not going to breathe any bigger, but I'm going to be louder like this. That's not good for my voice. Okay, so in the condition where um, they weren't really taxed because the consonants didn't require a lot of air, they just tightened up here to get louder. Okay? So look, though, what they did for the high volume consonants. So here we've got the high volume consonants. Oh, I'm sorry, let's go back here for a sec. Look what the adults did. For the low volume consonants, the adults know how to do this. They took in a bigger breath to get louder. Okay, so they're not going to use laryngeal tension to increase loudness. They took a bigger breath. That's going to provide them with greater subglottal pressure. So they basically did the healthier thing to get louder than the kids did. In this condition, again, the adults in the high uh, high volume consonants, the ones that use lots of air. The adults again breathed in bigger for the loud condition. And look at what the kids finally did. So the kids finally breathed in bigger too. So what it shows that is the kids are going to get away with whatever they can in terms of being loud without adding any extra work in terms of the respiratory system until their system is really, really taxed. So the high volume consonants where they use a lot of air to produce them, plus the increased loudness condition, finally kind of force them to breathe in bigger. But the adults did it really the more efficient way and the healthier way in both conditions. Yeah. So would it be safe to say that the, the extra effort you use to get louder is the same extra effort you would use to whisper? if you were trying to have someone hear you? No. Um, I think whispering is really, really very different than anything you do with your voice. Um, and because your vocal folds aren't completely adducted when you're whispering, it would never, adding a lot of um, air behind it still would never make it loud. So I can do a forced whisper like this, and it'll never be as loud as me talking loud. Because I'm not adducting the vocal folds, I can't build up subglottal pressure. So whispering is kind of a case by itself. Well, oh, I don't think you need nearly as much to whisper. Especially not a healthy whisper. The healthy whisper is the soft, breathy one. That doesn't take much air at all. The forced stage whisper is much harder to do, and that requires air. But still not as much as, I don't think as much. I know kind of what you're getting at because you're sort of wasting air by the whispering. Don't know. I don't know that anyone studied it. You could probably argue it either way. Yeah. Is it possible to... You could press it for her. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Is it possible to hear the difference between a, um, someone speaking louder based on more air intake versus someone speaking louder based on the actual just tightening of the laryngeal area? Can you hear it? The difference? Oh, I think you can. You can? Yeah. I think you can in highly trained people. Oh, okay. 
I'm not I, sure you can in Mere Mortals. So you can hear it, but I can't. <laughs> no, I, the, you know, there's a way that um, highly trained voice users speak um, that never uses too much laryngeal muscle tension. Mm -hmm. That is always based on shifting energy in different parts of, of the head. Um, you would hear a difference in them from when they're speaking with his resonant voice versus when they're speaking just laryngeally like from their throat. And the from the throat talking is the one that you never want to hear on stage. You always want the voice that's, that's resonant and uh, very easy to produce. So with trained people, I think you could hear the difference. Uh, uh, with most of us, we just talk from here. Yeah, that's, that was my next question. Yeah, it's usually so... Usually we're, we're using us. You bet. And usually it doesn't matter. Conversational speech is a who cares. It's when you're in a taxing situation that it matters. Yeah. You can hear that in singing, can't you? Like you bet. The, like a, my classic example is like Leanne Rhymes when she was younger, like first came out, it was you could just hear it almost and if you it almost made you like cringe, you're like, Oh, your voice is gonna go out. Like it's just that was always my classic example because you could just almost hear it her like you bet. Doing and country that. singers are notorious for singing from their throat versus anything that is resonant and projected. Um, that belting style is also pretty, when you hear a, a suppressed, we'll get to this more when we get to voice, but when you hear a suppressed vibrato and a person sings what are called straight tones, that too is usually from here. Somebody else had a question? So yeah, you can probably perceive it. Um, the thing to think about is if you can think when you need to be louder, you, you take a bigger breath, you're almost always going to be healthier and the vocal folds will, will, will be happier. <laughs> Little anthropomorphic vocal folds. Okay, so there's one more study that I wanted to highlight. Um, this one is with just adults. Now we're not looking at developmental changes, we're looking at changes associated with aging and how the respiratory system changes with age. This is a, a kind of study design that's called cross-sectional. It means that the researchers didn't start with this group of 20-year-olds and then when these 25-year-olds turned 50, they studied them again, and when they got to 75, they studied them again. That would have been a longitudinal study, following someone over time. They're really, really hard to do for obvious reasons. So a cross-sectional study means you get a representative sample of a group of people with the characteristics you want. So a bunch of 25-year-olds, a comparable bunch of 50-year-olds, and a comparable bunch of 75-year-olds. One of the interesting things they found was there was only a difference in speech breathing strategies between the very youngest group and the oldest group. Okay, so the 25 to 50 year old group, they pretty much breathe the same. The 50 and 75 year old group breathe pretty much the same. But you could find differences between the youngest group versus the oldest group. Now some of these you would expect just what we anticipate, just based on what we anticipate with aging. Um, the youngest group had the smallest residual volumes. Okay, so when you looked at their entire vital capacity and their total lung capacity, um, their residual volumes were smaller. So they were able to use more of their total lung capacity to talk than the um, oldest group was. They had uh, less lung volume excursion, so they didn't go as high and they didn't go as far in that vital capacity curve, which usually means that they're probably being more efficient. Okay, they didn't need that huge range that the older people did. Now this is a measure that you'll see fairly often in the speech breathing literature, percent of vital capacity per syllable. It's really saying, um, how many cc's of air do I expend, do I breathe out per each syllable that I say? So the way you do this is you, you measure how much air a person has breathed out and you see how many syllables they said and you just divide it, cc's per syllable. If a person says, if a person uses, for example, uh, 200 cc's per syllable and another person uses 50 cc's per syllable, what would that tell you? What do you think the 200 cc's per syllable person is going to sound like? 
Yeah, probably breathy. So they're kind of talking like this. Their laryngeal valving is probably not very good. So they're not getting great vocal fold closure. So you would associate a smaller percent VC per syllable with more efficient speech production. And efficiency is always what we're after for speech production. We don't want to work hard. We don't want to waste air. OK, so all kinds of obnoxious things start to happen to you as you get older. Um, respiratory muscle forces start to decrease. You can't, uh, you can't contract muscles as quickly and as forcefully as you could before. Overall lung size decreases. So they kind of shrink a little bit. It's an ugly picture. The costal cartilages, the ones right here in front, that were cartilages for so long that kind of gave you that extra expansion. They ossify. So now they're like brittle and stiff. Yeah, yeah I told you it's depressing. <laughs> and then a lot of elderly people uh, tend to develop poorer and poorer posture as they age. And so that changes. Yeah, right, I do that too. <laughs> and now I elevate my rib cage. Um, so that changes the thoracic shape. So we've got all kinds of things working against us. You guys are all still OK. <laughs> So all of these things have effects on the speech breathing system. So we know that physiology is starting to work against us. And now our speech breathing has to adapt to that deteriorating physiology. So people who are elderly, sort of everyday run-of-the-mill elderly people, um, breathe into higher lung volumes within their VC curve. Okay, So this is the same thing that those seven-year-olds kids did. What's the advantage for elderly people breathing into higher lung volumes on the VC curve? What are they taking advantage of? Go ahead. Push, push the little button. <laughs> Less muscle work to counteract, like the same with the kids? Um, I don't think of it as less muscle work. I think of it as taking advantage of the relaxation forces. Because they're, they're up higher in the VC curve. The relaxation forces are in an expiratory direction. They get that little extra oomph when they're breathing out for speech. They have a larger lung volume excursion. Why might that be? They combine this with fewer syllables per breath group and greater lung volumes per syllable. What's all that implicating? So they're breathing higher. Um, they're, they're using more air to say the same thing as somebody else would. Their efficiency is de declining. Where, where, where in the system is the efficiency declining? The yeah. yeah, laryngeal, <laughs> right in the laryngeal system. So as you get older, again, every day run of the mill older people, the laryngeal system tends to lose uh, valving efficiency. They get a little bit breathy. You hear classic old people, they start having that kind of dry, creaky voice. That means that the vocal folds aren't valving as efficiently as they did before. They lose some of the suppleness um, that they had. So what do you think this, go ahead. So do the respiratory structures kind of reverse to back what it was like when you were talking about newborns? No, it doesn't get that bad and it's sort of a different kind of problem. Because remember in the newborn the problem was the, the rib cage was too compliant and elastic. Really the opposite problem is happening in an elderly person and the rib cage kind of stiffens up. And the system loses some of its elasticity. So finally, the lungs aren't zapping back to their collapse state as easily. But it also means that they're not exhaling air as well as they did before. So it's inefficient, but kind of for different reasons. So what are some functional impacts? OK, first picture, everyday little couple who just chats with each other over coffee in a quiet house at home. Are these respiratory changes going to matter for them? Probably not. You know, for regular old conversational speech use, it really doesn't matter. What if the person is, um, is like hitting 70 and a, uh, a preacher in an uh, in, in evangelical kind of ministry? Is it going to start to matter? You bet. So depending upon the demands that the person puts on their voice, if a person is determined to be an occupational voice user as they age, they need to find a way to counteract these changes. They need to be able to compensate for them in a healthy way, or they're just going to end up with voice problems. 
So if your regular little old ladies who retire and, you know, sit around drinking coffee and stuff, it's not going to matter. Nobody does that anymore. You know, most people stay active for a long time. Nobody can retire because all of the retirement plans crashed and burned in the stock market. So everybody's going to be using their voice occupationally for a long time. So you may encounter more people in your clinical practice who are older and still need to have a functional occupational voice. These are people you might need to work on speech breathing strategies with because you can't, they can't afford to get loud with laryngeal tension. They've got to be able to use the respiratory system to help them. Okay, so there is a caveat to all of this and to all of physiological aging that I really, really want you to understand. There's a concept in the literature, good research literature on aging, makes a difference between chronological age and physiological age. And it really, really matters in the aging literature. So physiological age is your age in years, okay? 90-year-old person is a 90-year-old person. Wait, did I say physiological? Sorry. <laughs> if I could do that cool talking backwards, I'd take it back. Um, <laughs> chronological age is your age in years. Physiological age is the condition of your body. So you often hear the phrase, well, he's got a body of a 50-year-old when the guy's 70. Okay, the body of the 50-year-old is the person's physiological age. You can do all kinds of things to keep your physiological age less than your chronological age. And certainly you want to do that. So the classic case for physiology over chronology, although I haven't seen him in a while, and you have to be my age to know this guy is Jack LaLanne. Jack LaLanne is amazing. Is he still around doing juice stuff? Oh, that's good. He's getting up there. Isn't he like past 80 at this point? And he still swims laps. He was the very, very first guy like in the 50s to have a fitness show on TV before everybody else had them. And he's just in amazing condition for a man his age. He's over 80. He still swims, you know, a few miles every day. He still does weights. He used to do um, uh, stunts of, like, swimming and pulling a boat behind him. You know, he just did incredible stuff. So he was, like, the first fitness guru that ever was, and he's still really going pretty strong. So he's the very, very best example of physiological age not matching chronological age. You know, there are probably college guys who can't keep up with Jack LaLanne um, because he works out every day, he smokes. Uh, he smokes, yeah, right. <laughs> ah, yes, it's his secret. <laughs> um, all right, we'll assume he lives healthier than that. We'll, we'll say he doesn't smoke. Um, and he contends, and, and I really truly believe this, he contends that you're able to counteract the effects of chronological age if you work out. You know, that, that old concept of if you don't use it, you lose it. You just grind to a halt. It can be just horrible. Um, so he believes in exercise being like the most important thing you have to keep doing for eternity. Um, so try to find one that you like. And um, good nutrition going along with that, which would explain the juicing commercials, I suppose. So, but I do want you to note, if you read research on aging, you have to see how they matched up the people in the study. So if they matched up people just based on chronological age, you can have a 90-year-old person living independently at home self-sufficient versus a 90-year-old person in a nursing home with full care. There's no way they're comparable. So aging studies, there are ways to, to calculate for research purposes a person's physiological age. And if there's an aging study with a, one group that they're looking at and a control group, they have to be matched on physiological age rather than chronological age because that's what's going to tell you what's making the difference in their life. Does that make sense? So physiological age is what we care about the most. So we should all grow up to be like Jack LaLanne, except I never got into juicers. <laughs> so what questions do you have on the lifespan things? Anything? Okay, go ahead. Did did the kids in that one study, the, the seven-year-olds, did they know that taking a deeper breath would help them be louder? No, these were everyday kids. Uh -huh. 
untrained. So they just that's, that's a concept that we don't that we don't understand as it's a concept I mean, that we do naturally when our body forces us to. Okay. But otherwise taking a big breath seemed like more work than tightening up here. Okay. Um, I don't the next thing we're gonna get into is uh, physical acoustics. I don't have that posted yet. Um, at the latest I'll have it posted Monday, so watch for it for the notes. Okay? Alright, have a good weekend guys.